Well, that's enough about you. Let's talk about me. <laughs> Who here is new? Who's not been to a convention before? Oh, you poor, poor fools. Well, here's the thing that I usually say. You're going to make a lot of friends. That's what's going to happen. You're going to come to one of these, you're going to make friends. Much as I love going to Comic Cons and going to big signing events and stuff like that, here, we make okay. friends. Here, we see each other a lot. Here, you're going to make friends you're not going to be able to get rid of, which is kind of fun too. I feel that way about Elsrick. So just... Only joking. So, well, welcome. Here we are in Vegas. How many of you partied last night? How many of you are over 21? Doesn't cover everything, does it? <laughs> what do you want? I've come to ask, I've come to ask you a question, Mr. Shepard. Cool, what's up? <laughs> Other side. Um, is there a type of character you want to play that you haven't had the chance to portray? Oh, I like the, the ones you crossed out a bit too. Or well, maybe uh, yeah, a yeah. show or fan of you want to cross over to and you're just waiting for the call. Yes. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I'm waiting for that call. Hey, you. <sighs> you speak for everybody now? <laughs> hey, you. I answered your question. Oh, okay then. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. You're welcome. <sighs> Next, who'd you come as? Crazy Femme Cass? Is there any other Cass? <laughs> Apparently not. Go on, what's your question? Hello, love. <laughs> Doesn't work on me. My question is, uh, there's a rumor about rebooting the X-Files. Would you recreate your character if you had the chance? Because he is still alive. <laughs> I mean, Chris had what? 11 years to work out how to bring the character back, he couldn't do it then. So I very much doubt he's going to bring it back now. Do not think. Very clever. Next question. Hi, Mike. Hey. Have we enjoying Vegas so far? I don't know. <laughs> I am, actually. So my question is, a couple months ago, you said you were going to show us your abs by the holidays. <laughs> it's not the holidays yet. Well, we haven't shown us yet, so would you show us now? No, not yet. Give me five. Can I get five? Let's see what it is. Imagine it's a little one. What you got? Ah, uh, well. So, next question. Where'd you go? Oh, I'm busy. <laughs> My question is, I, I know you're interested in going on show, but... Uh, Sorry, I'm having horrible flashbacks. <laughs> uh, have you got any news about that? Have I got any nude stuff? <laughs> <laughs> news? Have I got any news? Yeah. Um, there's interesting things going on in the Gulf. Uh, I mean, what do you mean news? News about what? Uh, I, I had said, uh, we know you're interested in going on Sherlock, uh, but have you... We know you're about? interested in going on Sherlock. Yes. I don't quite know how to take that. <laughs> <sighs> um, listen, trust me, if I'm on Sherlock, you'll find out about it. We've been waiting a while, see what can happen, what might, might not happen, etc. Hurry up. Good enough for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. You do realize in Vegas the walk of shame is not a cool thing to do. <laughs> Carrying your shoes denotes you've been out all day. <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> Girls, I should have said. You like the costume? Can you make a deal with me? You can't afford me, baby. <sighs> okay, I get it. <laughs> Is that the right tartan? Yes. It is, isn't it? What? Oh, I like this. This is good. 
What's your name? Mariah? Hi, Mariah. Hi. How old are you? Six. Anything you want to know? No. <laughs> I'm good with that. I knew everything at six, too. <laughs> everything worth knowing. Good costume. Good costume. Hi. Hi. Hello, girls. Hi. Enjoying yourself. No, you've got two people sitting next to you. They know you. You don't know her? Is she friendly? So far, it's pretty good. See, you're going to make friends. It's a good thing. Hey. Hi. What's up? Um, my question is who would be your workout partner? Fictional character, who would be your workout partner? Fictional workout partner? Fictional workout partner. Fictional workout partner. Go sit down, I'll work that out. Do I need time on that one? <laughs> Fictional workout partner. I put about six or seven pounds back on over Christmas. I have to go take it off. Ah, hate it. Hi. Um, I am a big fan of all your work, just so you know. All my work. All your work. Um, but I'll I take another one. <laughs> I am interested in your time on Firefly as well. <laughs> So here we go. This is the same stupid ass questions that I get about. So we really love you. We think you're wonderful. What's it like working with with Jordan Jensen? It's the same question. It's the same bloody question. What's it like working with Nathan? He's a lovely man. Very Canadian. Very polite. Has a lovely family. He's a good guy. I actually have a drawing of a dragon that he did for my oldest son, Max. Very cool. What's it like working with Nathan? It was an amazing time for him to be working. I think it was his first uh, one-hour TV show he'd been doing. We got a guy, you know, two guys, seven guys, a dwarf, seven pieces, and whatever, on a pizza place. And uh, he'd always done like half hour sitcoms. And this, he went into Firefly as a, uh, as a like the, the first real one-hour he was doing. And he was, it was fun to watch him work. He loved it, he's a really generous guy. Now sit down. <laughs> Fictional workout. <laughs> Fictional. <laughs> Fictional. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. You're really not crossing the streams there. <laughs> Alright, come on you, give me a question that's worth answering. Mark, is there anything you look for in a role? No! In particular, that you... No! Makes you want to accept or... No! Nothing? <laughs> no. Is there anything I look for in particular? Oh, yeah! Is it interesting? No. Is it exciting? Have you said no to a role? I've said no to many roles. Saying no to you now. Oh. Be nice. Oh. This isn't Misha's panel. <laughs> wakey, wakey. <laughs> Haven't had my breakfast yet. That's what you get for waking up in Vegas. Hi, Mark. Hey. Um, so, a friend of mine told me that you love the Beatles. <laughs> A friend of yours, that a friend of yours wouldn't have like scruffy hair, yay scruffy beard, yeah, yay high, you say? <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> He's just made him five feet tall. <laughs> I'm sure he'll enjoy that. It's just, uh, payback is going to be interesting. I heard about this, but I haven't fully heard the extent of what he said. What did he really say? He said that you fucking hate them. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
But I what? Do I love Ringo? No. no. Oh, look, I, I don't. I mean, if I have to explain my position on the Beatles, it's really simple. It's a um, they're really important in music. I love John Lennon. Don't get me wrong. John Lennon is. A good one. But I really, I don't think there's ever been a Beatles song that somebody else hasn't covered better. <laughs> scrambled eggs, how I love those scrambled eggs. I'm like, not a big fan. Let's put it this way. Uh, everybody under the age of 18, put your fingers in your ears. Ready? Go. Uh, there's certain things you can do to Marvin Gaye that you can't do to the Beatles. <laughs> and I listen to music because I either want to do that or fight, or something similar. Uh, the Beatles is like, to me, like listening to James Taylor. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> Cleverly crafted, wonderful, brilliantly clever stuff that people like Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Wonder and Joe Cocker and other people took their stuff and made it so much better. I'm sorry, do you want to hear Ringo singing? What would you do if I sang out of two? Would you stand up and... There's a great story about, about McCartney going to see Jimi Hendrix play in London on the Saturday after the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band had come out on Thursday. And Hendrix was playing Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band on the stage. <laughs> Really good. There you go, troublemaker. Go sit down. <laughs> Next, I'm going to pay Curtis back for this big time. Um, what? What? Um, I was just wondering, as a musician, what other bands or musicians inspired you to? What a great voice. Yeah. Thanks, I grew myself. <laughs> I don't think you did. I think your parents would probably beg to disagree with that. A little bit, maybe. A little bit, maybe. What was the question? What musicians or artists inspired you to be a better musician than an artist? <laughs> Is this one I'm going to have to sit down for as well? <laughs> Probably adoration and love. It's pretty cool being a drummer in a band. It's pretty cool being an actor. It's pretty cool doing that. Yeah. I did it for the nookie. <laughs> Thank you. It's the telling of stories. Be honest with you, it's the telling of stories. Telling stories is fun. Ask Curtis. <laughs> That's what he does for a living. That man is an excellent teller of stories. Some of them are true, some of them are not. Um, but that's what it is, telling stories, makes no difference. Music, paintings, sculpture, it's all telling of stories. I had this weird conversation with Max uh, and, and Sarah the other night about I'm trying to find out why, you know, when people say, I like this or I don't like that, right? It's this whole sort of, well, that's just a matter of taste, and that's just this, and you know, well, you're entitled to your opinion. I hate that phrase. Hey, yeah. Nice shirt. Um, and it, it sort of worries me that, that, that things get dismissed as taste. I think there is a sort of universal law of, of, of sort of excellence in any form of art that you can look at things you don't particularly like, me in particular, and still see the value of it and see how excellent something is. That in its genre and in, in, its, in its place, it's a fantastic execution of something. And I think a lot of it comes down to how much passion has actually gone into it, how much effort, energy, and passion has gone into it. I know we have something called the uncanny valley. I mean, we deal a lot with digital, digital domain nowadays. All of us are dealing and seeing digital. And they want to build human beings and put them on screens, very Max Hedron-like, and uh, so that they don't actually have to deal with us at all. They can make, make the, these models do whatever uh, in our place. And there's, there's this, this phenomenon called the uncanny valley that a human being can discern that that is not a human being. You can see that the digital rendering is not a human being. It's a very uncomfortable thing. We're built that way, biologically wired that way, so that we don't pick things other than human beings to mate with it. <laughs> it's pretty much part of the biology. Um, it's a protection mechanism. So there's a real difficulty in creating human beings that aren't human beings in that way. And I think the opposite effect of that is that we sense things that are not organic. And I think our art and our appreciation of music and all of these things is not just a matter of taste. 
there's a certain core element of things that sings to us or, or speaks to us that is really simple. And it's not just the way you relate to it, that's why you can become more fanatical about it, to use the true sense of fanatic. Um, but it's not just like, oh, I, I love all aspects of Supernatural. It's like there are things about it that are really good. But you can look at TV shows that you don't like, and, and there are some that you go, well, it's still brilliant, it's just not something I enjoy. But why do we look at uh, Van Gogh and use universally? Um, go, it's kind of amazing that somebody can actually create this. Or the statue. You can't argue about the Statue of David. It's just like, it's not an argument you can have. It is what it is. It'll never not be, what it, not be something that's an incredible human achievement. It's, it's, it's beyond our comprehension and our ability to understand it. And what's funny is when you get to the Beatles and stuff like that, you, you, you have to validate that of their that of their era and of their ilk, what they created, or a lot of what they created, has had a profound effect on us for those reasons. It's, there's, there's something in there that makes it excellent. And what I think is really bad is there is so much TV and so many films and so much music that does absolutely nothing for me. Absolutely nothing. It was funny to watch the, the, you know, the Pharrell court case where everyone's freaking out in the music industry. It's not that similar, it's not like a straight steel. Yeah. George Harrison had it with My Sweet Lord, and uh, She's So Fine, which was the, one of the most famous players in court cases, and it's to do with how many notes were the same, and the feel of it, and, and, and you're talking about now we've done everything in music, and now we've produced everything in music, how the hell do you pin it? Is it a straight left, is it not a straight left? And what's really funny is, I don't care for the Robin Thicke song at all. I put Marvin on any day of the week, and it's not because, it's not because I'm an elitist, or it's because, well, Marvin Gaye's cooler. It's just there's something about that song in its time and its place that is so fantastic. Um, and then to bring it back to what we're all here for, which is talking about Supernatural or whatever, um, <laughs> there are, I know for a fact, because I've worked on other shows, that there is a level of excellence on the show that I currently work on, which is not the same as every other show that's made. I know that from working on, you know, Doctor Who, there was a level of excellence in Doctor Who. Sherlock, Who, I mean, Firefly, Battlestar, all of these shows that were done that I was lucky enough to participate in. Um, you're talking about the endeavours of hundreds of people who are putting their whole hearts into a situation. Everything they've got, everything they care about. And, the, and it's infectious, and it's truly infectious. And they make these products for us, and we watch these products, and there is a, I think, a biological reaction to it, is that it's done with passion. And if you can, if you can latch onto it, if you're just open enough to see the beauty in it, as, as the preface to Richard Dorian Gray, uh, Oscar Wilde wrote, you know, any person thinks, there's any person who can't see the beauty in art is a philistine or something. Um, if you stay open to it, you can find things that are fantastic and beautiful in almost anything. Stand still long enough and open your heart. That's what the trick is. So there. He did, a, he did a good impression. I heard it was a good impression. That was the part that really annoyed me. <laughs> I, I, oh, you've got cookies. I love it. Thank you. I have to find another workout partner. <laughs> Who's next? I am. Over here. What's <laughs> up? Speak up. Me. Oh, Thank you. Don't point. Behind you. Behind you. Hurry up. Hi. I love your sass, by the way. It's wonderful. Excuse me? <laughs> To sit down, or shall I wait till you're halfway through your question? <laughs> oh. Okay, I'm drinking for everyone, so what's your favorite drink? I'm 25 years sober, you're a bit late to the party. I did all mine and most of yours. I used to drink professionally, the last thing you want to do is see me drink it, trust me. That's how I got to America. <laughs> hey, yeah. Hey, Mark. My question is, what do you enjoy seeing the most in the fandom, um, like art or the songs that people write for it? I think what I was talking about earlier is the answer to that question, which is it doesn't really matter what it is. 
It matters if it's done with heart and meaning, and love and affection. I love the actions taken. You know, I don't always know whether I believe in 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 supreme beings or higher powers or any of these things. But what I'm reminded on a daily basis as a human being is that there is a lot of things that are more powerful than us. And the actions taken in loving service towards other people is absolute proof of the power greater than myself. So when I see people put their heart into anything, I see, you know, what a lot of people over years have described as God, I think. I think that's what you see. It's just my personal opinion, but I'm just saying that's, so I find perfection in endeavor. I find, I find perfection in passion. As an artist, I say thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Vegas, not Rio. Oh, we're at the Rio. So. I'm sorry, I accidentally called you Matt at Phoenix Con. I don't, I don't. I know, but it was a moment of shame for me. Who did you come as? I am Showgirl Cassia. Is there any other? It's a little more fun point, like slightly. What's really scary is that's what I was wearing when I went out to dinner last night. <laughs> What's your question, Showgirl oh. Cassia? Who was your celebrity crush growing up? Celebrity crush. I don't think celebrity meant the same thing when I was growing up. We were playing rock, rock, rock back then. That's how old I am. As opposed to rock, paper, scissors. Rock, rock, rock. I'm an old man. Um, shut up, you. I'm an old man. You're not an old man. <laughs> um, celebrities were very different when I was... I was a kid, you kind of idolized people that did things, not people that made lots of noise. Celebrities make lots of noise. Like early people, you know, George Best, LA, uh, talking about football. I mean, you got, you got so many, so many people like that. I remember Muhammad Ali. I remember he used to stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning to watch Muhammad Ali box. Greatest sportsman of all time to watch. You cared whether he won or not. Um, Paul Newman, Cagney. All sorts of cool people. Musicians, there so many cool musicians. Do I yeah. Marvin, Smokey, Van, Al Green. You sense a pattern here? What would you do in that song? Scrambled eggs. How scrambled eggs? Did we actually wrote that? McCartney had the balls to write scrambled eggs, how I love those scrambled eggs. And everybody says that yesterday is the most beautiful song ever written. I'm like, it's about scrambled eggs. Do you, you don't like them? I don't think they can be overrated. In the, I think they're, they're idolized in the strangest way. I know what you mean. It's a very, it's a lot of, a lot of shouting for something not quite as big as, but they did change music. I mean, they were a catalyst for changing music. But I, I figured that they did that at the expense of black music. So I always figured the people that were actually making, I mean, do you know, you know, anyone here know who the Funk Brothers were? Anyone here not from Detroit who knows who the Funk Brothers were? Anyone here that's white who knows who the Funk Brothers were? Sorry. That's pretty good. I mean, for a room of this size, that's pretty amazing. The Funk, the Funk Brothers, this will blow your mind. You ready for this? Have more number one hits than Elvis and the Beatles combined. And you have no idea who they are. But the Funk Brothers is, all the Funk Brothers were is the name for the backing band of every great Motown song that was ever played. So every great Motown hit that was ever played was played by the same group of, I can't remember how many people, it's probably about 14 or 15 people. But James Jameson, all these people, these incredible players that played on all of these amazing songs. Um, never got the recognition they deserved. Mm. Very interesting. It's a great documentary about it, you should see it. What's really amazing about the documentary is none of the real artists will come and sing it. Isn't that crazy? I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. It's like 23 from stardom and you would see you know, the real people when they're talking about it. But there was obviously no money 
to pay Diana the rocks so that you know, Chuck Khan came and sat down with us. Yeah, whatever. What, what question did you ask me? Who's my celebrity crush? Celebrity crush when you were growing up. How old are you? 20, almost 21. Almost 21? You're not supposed to say that, baby. You're supposed to say 21. <laughs> um, who's yours? Right now? No, who was yours? Your first, like, really big... I don't think you'll know him. Who? Aaron Carter. Of course. I know Aaron Carter is. Okay. I'll tell you who Aaron Carter is. I have two kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, you like Justin Timberlake, right? Um, <laughs> Post Timberlake. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Well, that's the interesting, that's the interesting thing. What? <laughs> sit down. I like him, sit down. <laughs> sit down. No, I love him, but you know, I don't you know, specialize him in it. So. But do you, know, do you know what I think one of the greatest musical performances I've seen in the last 20 years was? What? No. One of the greatest musical performances I've seen in the last 20 years was Justin Timberlake at the MTV Music Awards in 2013. It was a serious, I think it's something like an eight and a half minute medley, including in sync, get in the middle. It's sort of in my condition. Um, but it's the most incredible vocal and dancing performance I've ever seen. I just looked and went, this, this guy is probably one of the greatest showmen I've ever seen. But look at the 2013, I think he did it in 2014 as well, but it's not as good. The 2013 one, unbelievable. Go YouTube it, it is absolutely breathtaking. And you realise he's singing live, it is mind-blowing. While he's dancing. Good dancer too. Alright, thank you. Who are you? What do you want? <laughs> I was wondering if okay. you're playing... Don't wonder, stand still, behave yourself. I was wondering, is that playing a demon? King of Hell, you've had any fans try pouring holy water or exercising it? Well, I don't know about you, but I always thought it's most sort of sci-fi and fantasy fans of being somewhat intelligent. <laughs> and I can't see that far. Well, it happens, it happened to me, because I'm a pagan in a family of nothing but devout Christian Catholics. Yeah, but that's crazy people. <laughs> I'm sorry, you have to be a crazy person to pour holy water on somebody. You have to be a crazy person to believe it's holy water. Starbucks, that's the, the scary part. What makes it any holier? You know, there was a man called Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, who was burned at the stake for saying that there is actually nobody that can stand between me and my God, so there's no such thing as holy water because nobody could render it holy, right? Try that one. Did, did, did steam or smoke come off you? <laughs> we still want to know, don't we? You should have rolled your eyes back in your head and started like, <laughs> spitting out black goo. It'd be great. Are you saying there's a demon and the king of hell? How do you know I'm a demon? How do you know that I'm a demon? That's how you became. Yeah, Says me. You went to him. Actually, I think you started out as an angel. Maybe. Who knows, right? Never seen my eyes flash, have we? Yeah. Where? <laughs> On a Funko Pop doll? Never happened. Watch the show. It's never happened. 8.02. 802, my eyes have never flashed. The guys are asleep. Oh. 8.02. Yeah. 20 past 7. <laughs> my eyes have never flashed. I'm in the show, I can't even know. No, totally. Hey. Hi. You're going to ask me a vapid question as well. <laughs> I was curious as to how you guys uh, celebrate birthdays and things on set. Oh, they're evil. <laughs> I think we try to hide our birthdays from other people. You see what they do when they're trying to be nice to you? God, give them any excuse, they'll just crush you into the ground. Especially the tall one. <laughs> Shakes people at will. It's like a giant puppy. <sighs> Thanks, now you depressed me. Go sit down. Hey, uh, how you doing? I'm fine, how are you? Not bad. Um, I just want to say, first of all, that your uh, scene in the season 8 finale it was just phenomenal. That was just phenomenal acting from you. Thank you.
I just wanted to know what your most challenging scene was to film as Crowley, like acting wise. What was the most challenging for you to do as Crowley? I've got a few. I mean, the end of season eight was fun. That was that was pretty much fun because we did that in sequence. So we, that was three days in that church, which was kind of amazing. That was a that was a. But talking about that, I've, I've said it a few times. The feeling that everybody was there to make the most excellent story that was possible to make, and that every member of the crew, every member of the cast, everybody gave 100% <laughs> just to make sure that that happened. It was fantastic. It was an amazing experience. You know, difficulty. I know there's, there's, there's technical things that can get in the way, and there's, you know, I remember I did, a, I did an episode where I spent the entire time in the office, in that sort of, in the Korean lawyer's office that I borrowed, and all my stuff was on the phone, and it was the most ridiculously difficult stuff for me to remember, I don't know why. So I had terrible trouble trying to remember the dialogue. So that was actually the most difficult scene I ever had to do, because I didn't know what I was talking about. Just because of the back and forth, or... I mean, pretending to back and forth on the phone? It's not, it's just sometimes it happens. Sometimes it's really hard to, to, to attach to something. And then there are some, there's some scenes that seem really difficult or really long and they're just easy. Because the sort of culmination of a bunch of work that you've done or the, the realisation of something <laughs> that you really care about. So, um, I mean... Well, you're a good actor anyway, so it's probably second nature to you. <laughs> I don't know, I kind of have to work at it. It's not always the easiest thing. That's the, that's the part, that's, that's the hardest part of being an actor, is what you do when it isn't working. When it's not coming easy. And when it's not, you still have to, you still have to deliver, you can't just like, not do it. But there's a lot of effort that goes into that. There's a lot of very talented people around me, so I've used a lot of backup, so it's good. Thank you, though. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Hi. Hi. So, I was wondering Funny childhood stories. It's terrifying. I don't know you. Funny childhood stories. I don't know, was my childhood funny? I don't know, I can't think of anything. Generally, I'm so old, I can't think of anything. Um, I used to, instead of going to school, I used to go to museums. I spent a lot of time like, going to art galleries and museums as a kid. At 12 years old, I, I really was so effed off at school at that point that I used to sort of just head for school and then get on a train and go somewhere. And I was very good at convincing people that I was actually on some sort of school trip. Yeah. I went to um, uh, the Corona Soda Park Factory in Finchley and hung out there for about five days before they worked out that it was probably no reason for me to be there. <laughs> and at one point they, helped, they let me make cardboard boxes. It's kind of cool. It's the sort of stuff I used to do, it was weird. It's a weird kid. They're all weird kids, that's the point. But yeah, it's a weird child, funny child. It's was funny about it. I don't know. Was that funny? It was kind of funny. Weird funny. Thanks. Thank you. Flashbacks now. I'm going to be asleep. What do you do? Is there any right way to do a <laughs> at a convention, or were you doing this just? Oh, thank God for that. You just jacked your knee. So you jacked your knee, <laughs> like I said. <sighs> well, good luck. <laughs> uh, there is my workout partner. <laughs> what? Not what? It's fictional to me. <laughs> she could be lying. Not yet. <laughs> I, uh, I asked Tim, uh, the overlord... In so why are you asking me? <laughs> what am I, sloppy seconds? No, he just came around first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
um, whether Kate would be taking over uh, over help from Crowley now that he's a dead <laughs> demon. And yeah, I'm yeah, because that's what we're going to do. What do you think, troublemaker? <laughs> now you start trying to cause controversy there, but. I think that that would be the, the logical thing, assuming that you actually get rid of your mom. <laughs> My mom or Crowley's mom? Crowley's mom. Uh, okay, just check it. You know I have to call my mom after every episode to go like, I really do not feel this way about you. Just so you know. Like, I know it's fun to watch that. Uh, yeah, Rowena, kind of interesting. We're moving into a very, where are we, 14, 15? 15. 15. We're moving into a really interesting part of the show. It's getting very interesting right now. I think some of your stuff will get answered. Okay. Thanks. Hey. Uh, hi, Mark. Hi. So, I'm just Hello. wondering, how does it feel to be the nerd god? You the what? The nerd god. Nerd god. I'm not a nerd god. I'm a geek god. I'm not a nerd god. What's the difference? Uh -huh. Everybody take her outside. Have a word. For the rest of the weekend, everybody's going to come up to you and give you a definition. Don't do that to me. Um, no, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. Ask Curtis. <laughs> Is it nerds like the Beatles? No, that's not it. <laughs> Something like that. What's it like being a nerd god? I'm not I'm a geek god. Go. Sorry. What was your overall favorite role? <sighs> I haven't finished with this one, so. Well, I mean, I could be dead at the end of the season, you never know. <laughs> Guys, you never know. I mean, it's like, could be. What do you mean, no? No, no. Hey. It's, yes, it's, it's supernatural, trust me. This 